Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Sunday, December the 13th, 2020. On this edition of the Politocrat, a look at crowds. They say that two's company and three is a crowd and that there are safety in numbers or is a safety in numbers. Well, do you think so? I'm going to be taking a look at crowds and their history. Very interesting indeed. That's coming up next. Don't forget that you can now listen to the Politocrat podcast on Audible at audible.com and wherever you get your podcasts, please subscribe now and thank you for your support. Welcome back. So crowds, 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 you know, Many years ago, someone told me, I don't like crowds. And I remember when it was said to me, and I was trying to figure out why. So I asked, why don't you like crowds? And the response was, well, just too many people. I just, it's it's scary to me. It's scary. And I was thinking about this because I'm someone who actually likes crowds, or at least when I was younger, I loved crowds. I mean, I loved to be around lots of people. I mean, not necessarily having 250 friends, but just being around people, the idea that you were around people. And that's, you know, one of the things, obviously, right now in a pandemic, you can't be around people. Um, You can't certainly be around that many people, you know. And the whole better part of this last whole year, if you look back to February and March of 2020, is that you are only around a very few people, family, um, you know, or anything like that. And or, or you're not or you're just completely isolated. And so that's a real test, especially in that situation with a pandemic. Um But as I got older, I started to like crowds a little bit less. And I think the reason I felt that way is because there is some peace and comfort about being with only either a few people or being by yourself. And you can learn a lot about yourself when you are by yourself. And then there are people who are afraid to do that because I think the society sends this message that if you are by yourself, particularly when it comes to if you are a woman and by yourself, you know, there's a stigma in a male dominated society that says, well, there's something wrong with you, lady, because you're alone or you're by yourself and you might not be lonely at all. You're just by yourself. You want some time alone. There is no crime in that. And I hope that people understand that there's no crime in having alone time. It's an actually very important thing. And there's lots of people who don't ever have that. Who, And they never really find out who they are. And then they get married. And then they, you know, and they never have time to really get to know themselves before they get into relationships, marriages, whatever it might, partnerships, whatever it might be. And sometimes some of that ends up with, an un, an untangling, you know, a divorce, a, a separation, a split, a breakup. But that's not really where I'm going in this episode. Where I am going is back to where I started, which was crowds. And this person telling me, oh, I know I don't like crowds. And I just started to wonder about crowds 
and what it is about them. And when I got that answer, well, you know, there's too many people, uh, you know, you just don't know. I started to think today, actually, about what are the purposes of having crowds around? I mean, obviously, people are traveling, so you're going to have crowds at airports. I mean, forgive me for for going in this direction, but it's a direction that becomes, as you might gather, to be a little creepy and disturbing. (laughs) Because think about the crowds that you're a part of. When you go into a crowd, people go to uh, are parts of crowds to watch concerts. You know, these are the most common things. People are parts of crowds to watch movies in the theater. Well, obviously not now, but they are in that kind of arena. They're more an audience than a crowd, but I guess it's the same difference. People are parts of crowds to watch whatever kinds of entertainment there might be. You know, that's something that happens. Whether it's a sporting event, whether it is a a gathering you know, for some kind of other show. People go into uh, parts of crowds for political events, whether it's to watch somebody speak at a rally, something like that, right? Those are crowds. And then there are, this, this is something that came to me. What about crowds and the aspects of crowds you can think of, if you had to think about all the crowds you were a part of, in your whole life, whether it's to an attend, attend a concert of some kind, a play, you could probably think of all the times that you were in crowds where good things happened or you were in that crowd for a positive reason, whether it was a peaceful demonstration, the women's march that we've been having every year since 2017, the March for Our Lives, Black Lives Matter movement. And and this is something that functioned before the 21st century. Obviously, you go back centuries. But I think what I want to ask, at least for the predicate of this exploration, is when you think of crowds, think of all the crowds that you can that gather around and for positive events and affirmative reasons. And think about the crowds that don't, that gather for something much more sinister and nefarious and and violent. And I would just ask you to think about those two crowds and then investigate yourself and, and find out for yourself whether or not more crowds gather for things that are positive or do more things gather, more people gather in crowds for something that is negative. And by that I mean something negative, I mean something violent. And then I'm going to explore that for a bit. And then that really hit me when I when I actually sat down to think about that. More people, it seemed to me that in history, more people gathered in crowds for violent things than they did for things that were more positive and life affirming and love affirming and I mean there was Woodstock in nineteen sixty nine. And there were loads of people there, hundreds of thousands of people. And it was all about love and peace and the music. You'll never have a gathering like that again. And I don't mean the crowd, I mean the music talent. I think, if I think back, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Richie Havens, The Who, Santana. I think, um, oh my God, there's just so many. I can't even really think about how many, but there, and there was loads of people there, loads for something really good. I mean, there's something in California here, or is it in Nevada called the Burning Man Festival? 
And I'm not so sure that that goes on. It certainly didn't happen this year. At least um, not in the way it would t- typically. And I've never been to Burning Man. But it's this it it's this spiritual thing and people are dancing around fires and uh, some people are naked. Some pe- you know, it, And then it changed into this. Some people who I know who did attend or have attended Burning Man, and maybe you're one of them, said that the event, if you are in California or Nevada, um, said that the event began to become more corporate, diluted. It, the energy and essence of it disappeared into something else and it became something else. But then we know well that crowds do grow or do metastasize or do appear for things that aren't so positive. I think back, and we can go way back. I mean, we can go back into the AD era, Anno Domini. We can go Domini. We can go back to the, the, the Roman Empire, right? We can go back before then, even. But I am going to go to the Roman Empire. The gladiators... People would appear at the Colosseums, at the Colosseum in Rome, and they would go there to watch people fight. And maybe there's an animal involved in that fight. People now go and watch bullfighting, or have done for for years and centuries to watch bulls and matadors. And it's really scary when you start to think about crowds screaming and cheering for that as so-called entertainment. There's something really evil and unsettling, isn't there, about that? I find it to be. I don't like crowds. That person once said to me. I don't like crowds. And this was years ago I was told this you know this woman woman there was a woman who told me i don't like crowds she said i don't like crowds and it's only now you know many years later that i've started to actually really give some thought not not necessarily to what she said but to the implications of why. And you just go back to the Roman Empire and you go back to the Colosseum, the gladiators. People watching violence in large groups, cheering it on, a bloodlust. That to me is, it's very unsettling. But hey, What about just yesterday in the United Kingdom where people, albeit a thousand people only, were clamoring around a boxing ring to watch Anthony Joshua and his opponent box in the boxing ring. Watch them beat each other silly for nine rounds. Heck, I have shelled out pay-per-view money to do that. I didn't do it last night, although I listened to the fight on the radio. Anthony Joshua won, by the way, in the ninth round with a knockout. The British boxer, um, who is a really decent person, but he makes a living with his fists. And there are people who understandably object to that. There are people who don't like violence, obviously. And it's not that I like violence. I don't like violence. But hey, I do watch boxing matches on television. Never been to one live. That's on my bucket list. But again, it's violence, right? And we're paying to watch it. And I'm not talking about paying to watch it on a big screen. I'm talking about being there in person in a crowd watching two people beat each other silly. And people cheering. I mean, there is a through line here. 
And that kind of cheering violence has, has become very acceptable. And it's also done because there's profit involved. So the people fighting end up getting millions of pounds or dollars or whatever the currency is, the euro or whatever the economic currency is. The promoters of these fighters end up getting millions of pounds or dollars. You've paid your money if you if you're someone who likes to watch boxing, if you're a boxing fan, I'm a casual boxing fan. And then you pay and if you really want to see a fight, you pay a certain amount of money. Because you can't go into a bar and watch these things now because of the pandemic. You pay a certain amount of money to watch this in the comfort of your own home or, you know, or you go to the fight to the extent that you can. I mean, in England, they let in a thousand people to watch that fight that I just talked about last night. But the point I'm, I'm making here is that this has been with us. These crowds... And then when you extrapolate it from gladiators and people cheering all this bloodshed and boxing, you can go back to, well, think about this. You you can go back to any, think about where this leads to. Before I get to that point, I'm going to talk about what happened on July the 12th, 1979 in Chicago. At a baseball game. The venue was Comiskey Park in Chicago on the south side. There was someone who developed this really bright idea. And you can tell there's sarcasm involved there. To have something called Disco Demolition Night. People were allowed into Comiskey Park to watch the hometown team, the Chicago White Sox, take on the Detroit Tigers. It was part of a double header, meaning that they played two games on that same night. Between games, there was this event called Disco Demolition Night. And it came at the end of an era or toward the end of a decade where disco was really the driving force. And I'd say around the mid-1970s, 74, 75, 76, when disco really took off. And I think it was around then, if I remember. And then it started to really gain steam after 74, after 75, um, and then a film called Saturday Night Fever, which um, obviously I think many people have seen. Maybe you haven't seen it, but you've certainly heard of it. John Travolta and, and company. That was 1977, and an incredible soundtrack by the Bee Gees, which is one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. I even um, shared uh, a song on Twitter at the popcorn R E E L last night from that uh, great soundtrack. And the song is how deep is your love, which is one of my favorite songs of the 1970s. And so disco was a movement and a thing and a, a music that was, you know, cultivated through black people in the United States uh, it was a real uh, heartbeat of black expression, um, Latino expression, and also gay expression. And so disco was very popular amongst many segments of the black community, of the Latinx community, and of the gay community at large. And the 1970s was was rooted in a lot of that in the United States. And I'm sure it was in other countries, I would bet. And so you had Studio 54, which was at its height in the 1970s. And then, yeah, people were using drugs. Well, people have been using drugs in America forever. Come on. It's not that you have to mark an era with it. I mean, people were being were stoned in the 50s, stoned in the 60s. There was something called Reefer Madness, which was a documentary back way back in the day that 
made drugs out to be the worst thing on the planet. And look, I don't. I don't get involved in getting high. Um, you know, my goodness, every one of us has tried some drug before, um, including myself. You know, but it doesn't do anything for me personally. Um, but I've tried, I mean, like everybody, certainly, especially if you're a certain age, um, many, if not every, many people, if not everyone has tried some kind of drug, some kind of substance. I'm not talking about prescription drugs. I'm talking about um, psychotropic drugs or, you know, pot or anything like that. And of course, in California, um, I, if I remember correctly, marijuana has been legalized now for a certain number of years and in other places there's there's an uh, an apothecary around not far from here where people line up in socially distanced fashion physically distanced fashion to pick up their prescription of or whatever they you know their their drug is or whatever pick up their drug and it's all legal now here in california But it wasn't all rosy, you know. Nineteen sixties, people were were getting high and, and people were ODing. People were, I mean, we've got opioid opioid crisis, but people in crowds were. And the sixties are always sold as this free love era, and of course it was. But there were people also ODing in massive numbers. That story doesn't get told often enough. There were women being physically attacked. You know, being violated. You know, the, so that stuff does not get, those kinds of events don't get spoken of. I mean, you remember well um, the Gimme Shelter concert with the Rolling Stones back in the day, where a woman was raped and I think killed in this large crowd of people. There's a whole documentary on this, by the way, as well. They've made at least one or two documentaries on it. I think it's called, I think the documentary is called Gimme Shelter. And of course, there was nothing, it was anything but shelter. Then I go back to this, I don't like crowds. And I, th- that comment. And then I think about the whole history of crowds. And this whole thing in Chicago. 1979, the summer, July the 12th, demolition, disco demolition night, and the crowds of people who were showing up and knowing that disco was cultivated um, in Black Expression, Soul Train, uh, you know, there's a Afro-Latino um, bent to it as well, and it became a a voice and anthem of of gay communities in the seventies, coming off of the Stonewall uh, unrest or uprising, I should say, and people manifesting their identities in music that was all about liberation, expression, positivity, love, and that was something that. And expressing feelings. And that was something that disco was about. There was a freedom to it all. There was a freedom. And it was a release valve, I think, from the 1960s. But the point I'm trying to get to here in this moment is that some owner, I think it's Bill Veck or whatever his name was, of the Chicago White Sox had this bright idea to have this thing called Disco Demolition Night. And it was pitched by some DJ, so-called shock jock, this white guy named, I don't know what his name was, Dan, whatever, Scott Dahl, or whatever his name was, or Dan Dahl, or whatever. 24-year-old white guy in a uniform, a an army uniform, and between the two games, he would come to the middle of the baseball diamond or near the, in the middle of the field or whatever. I don't remember exactly. And he would 
well, this is just crazy. You couldn't come into the ballpark. You couldn't come into Comiskey Park unless you paid A, 98 cents. And B, you had to bring a vinyl record with you. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? A stadium of 50,000 people with a vinyl record in their hands. And you were supposed to either hold on to the record or put it in some dumpster truck. And in fact, well, this is just crazy. Maybe you should listen to this for the next couple of minutes and then I'm going to come back and, and continue the story. This is now officially the world's largest anti-disco rally. There's the wrongs of people coming. And there's the wrongs and they're all carrying the albums. The late Bill Beck told me Sox Park had 70,000. First time Satchel Page pitched. There had to be 70,000 people in that ballpark. I don't know how they got in. You could see people coming through the portholes out in left field. There was holes cut out in the wall and people were coming up through the holes. People were swiping pops out of my tray and there wasn't anything you could do about it. You couldn't move, you couldn't go chase someone because you couldn't get anywhere. It seemed like there was kegs in every aisle of the ballpark at night, you know, because everybody was drunk. I said, you ought to have the pot concession. From what I just smelled down there, I think there must be a mass little load of pot here in this ballpark. Well, listen, we took all the disco records that you brought tonight. We got them in a giant box. And we're going to blow them up real good. They were supposed to just put them into a bin for Steve Dahl to blow up, but... Uh... Obviously, people brought more than one. Even before the game started, people were flinging records all over the place. The first disc that was thrown missed me by a couple of inches. It missed the right side of my head by a couple of inches. It was a real dangerous situation. I mean, I couldn't understand why they didn't delay the game. They're going, Rusty, Disco, you know, socks and be real loud, and we're going to kill Disco today. Disco is dead, you know, this and that. And I'm going... No, I was just in tech last night. How are you going to achieve that, right? Crazy, isn't it? And I'm going to play a little bit more of that audio, I think, um, so that you get a bit of an idea of what happened after that. But this is just absolutely nuts. So this guy, this DJ in Chicago, comes uh, comes on the field between games. And he blows up with explosives in a baseball stadium. Records, vinyl records of disco. And everybody cheers and then it gets uglier. He leaves, takes this victory lap in his general's uniform with an army helmet on. And leaves. And then the crowd just gets so unruly. They run on the field. Oh, it just gets nasty. It, they riot. And it's overwhelmingly a white crowd. Egged on by an alarmist. And someone who I think was stoking violence. Even though he claims he wasn't. Disco, the province of black and Latino peoples, an anthem for some gay communities, representing vibrancy, liberation, freedom, joy, love, expression. And this white guy comes along, 24-year-old, kid who is this so-called shock DJ which to me all uh, Howard Stern excluded is racist right it just conjures that to me and that you that he would be wearing a general's uniform and an army helmet and that he would be taking a victory lap in a vehicle 
it's like something out of the Roman Empire. It's like something out of Mussolini. It's fascist. It's And then you're blowing up records. It's tantamount to a Nazi book burning in Germany in 1932, 33, 34 and beyond. And the crowds are cheering and they're running onto the field and and you're burning records and you're burning the records specifically of people who are black, people who are brown. You're burning the records created by people who are gay. People who are straight. And it was all around this so-called shock jock who did this in Chicago. It was all around this disco sucks. That was the anthem, disco sucks. But why? Why, why was that something that sucked to this person or any other? And investigating that some more, and people were saying this then, so it's not some kind of revolutionary idea that I've just thought of, but it's just something that I just think is obvious. This was absolutely a white lash against black expression, at least this edition of it, this latest iteration of it. And I think what you had is a lot, because the crowds at the at Comiskey Park were, were, were white. I mean, it was 99.999% white. And they rioted, destroyed the the uh, baseball field and destroyed all, climbed up and down the foul poles of the stadium and destroyed things, stole things, ripped up the grass on the field. I mean, this wasn't about disco. This was about rioting. And it wasn't that they hated disco. They were, I think, it was about them hating the people who produced and performed it. The Bee Gees got this incredible backlash. Incredible backlash. And then typically from these white men who didn't like the fact that the Bee Gees had created this incredible soundtrack for Saturday Night Fever. By the way, the soundtrack is better than the film. I know some people love that film. But that film to me is, you know, there's some iconic moments, but that film is about some things that were, had a really uh, unpleasant underbelly, to say the very least. That's putting it mildly. Saturday Night Fever. It was about something deeper than music, even though music was much of that film. Some very unpleasant things happen in that movie. I don't even want to go any further, but for those of you who've seen it, you know. It's much more of an adult movie than it is a music movie, I think. But all this rage against the Bee Gees. And there, there's a Bee Gees documentary that also talks about this. That, that's on HBO and HBO Max. And, I, and it's, a, it's a good documentary. You should watch it. About the Bee Gees. And these are, you know, three straight white men who were adopting a lot of the rhythms and... Uh, stylistic affectations of black artists who earlier that decade in the 1970s and even before um, did, were, were obviously, you know, pioneers of this music as they are and have been. You had the stylistics, you had the spinners, you had the four tops way before that, the temptations um, and these other groups and a lot of them are, you know, they, they were straight black men who were adopting, you know, who were bringing these styles into American music, into the music that they created and invented. And so you had, what you had at the time of the 1970s and before that were white male bands from England who were adopting or appropriating or bogarting, whichever term you like to use, black music. The Beatles cited 
uh, influences. John Lennon did in particular, as did McCartney. Their influences for some of their songs like Let It Be and Hey Jude and a number of songs, they actually did acknowledge that. The Rolling Stones always have that they were studying black artists in America. Also uh, acknowledging that um, as well was Elton John. And then this is all in the 60s and 70s. Mick Jagger in particular, the Rolling Stones would always invite on blues artists in his concerts and still does, I think. Well, when, when the pandemic is over, he will go back to doing that. And so there were a number of these white British artists who understood where this was all coming from. But this whole disco night thing was something more savage. In my view, these crowds had come to participate in something really ugly and violent. And it was, I think, a reaction to their own insecurities and fears and and hate. And that they were homophobic and that they were racist. And I think that this DJ, this so-called shock guy, was the same. He just didn't really want to acknowledge it. It was a nightmare, that event. And that was really the last time anything ridiculous and dangerous like that was a part of a sporting event. And there are people talk about English football and the hooligans. But as you contemplate all of this, I mean, think about crowds. And I I will take it one step further. 11 years before that 1979 event, we had the Chicago Democratic National Convention. And there were crowds there attending a political event, but you know that that got very violent. You know the police got very violent, both inside and outside that event in 68, which was the, I always call 1968 the most turbulent calendar year in the history of the United States. Now, there are others that may rival it, obviously the 1860s um, and, and perhaps a bit before that, you know, 1600, 1619. My goodness, what was more turbulent than 1619 in the history of America? But I'm talking about in terms of the U.S. U.S. history began, what, in 1776? And there's no reason. I mean, well, there's lots of reasons about everything. But 1968 was, I think, the most turbulent calendar year in the history of this country. Now, some people would say that 2020 is the most turbulent calendar year. And I think that's a very good shout as well. I do think it's a very good shout. But I think in terms of all of the things that happened in this year of 1968, I think that that year still remains, still remains the most turbulent calendar year in the history of the United States. Dr. King assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy assassinated. What happened in Chicago, the Vietnam War, LBJ decided not to run again, the treason episode with Nixon, scuttling the peace talks in Paris. The very, very close election victory that Nixon had over Humphrey. I mean, there were so many other things going on in 68. The uprising, of course, in response to the assassination of Dr. King. The very next year you had Fred Fred Hampton, by the way. But what I'm getting at is these crowds and what they were reacting to. And when I think about that disco demolition night in 1979... And all of that rage and violence. I think back to crowds in the 1950s watching black people being lynched. So it's not about burning disco records. 
Prior to that, it was about burning black people alive. Then I think about Joan of Arc. Crowds gathering to watch, you know, Joan of Arc or other women being burnt at the stake. The so-called witches. And you can hear the rain falling here. I'm sure you are aware of that. We do need the rain, by the way. Here in uh, California. And actually, what rain is a really welcome thing. It's actually quite beautiful, rain. But think about this. This evolution of crowds and what they are and what they mean. And if you go back through history, it, they are terrifying. They really are because you have a mob. And you don't know what the mob's appetite is and until you put that raw meat in front of them. And I'm not talking about human beings. But you put this thing in front of them and either they recoil in horror at it or they embrace it. And that's something about the human condition or the human presence that can be so beautiful or so very terrifying that in an instant a crowd can turn, a crowd can switch. And it only takes the right or wrong conditions for that to happen. I mean, think about this. You have thousands of people in the 1950s and maybe beyond that. I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I'm sure there are but beyond that who would watch in their Sunday bests, dressed up with their families, their kids in tow, to watch black people be lynched in a town square here in the United States. Really terrifying stuff. Watch them be burned at the stake. Pouring, I mean, it, it gets graphic. Crowds have this function that in that case is of terror. Nazi Germany. People burning books. Just like people burned records and blew them up in Chicago in 1979. This is really bad stuff. And these crowds can be very dangerous. Safety in numbers. Well, I believe it was Milgram. Was it Stanley Milgram who once said, Milgram was, Stanley Milgram was someone who did the Milgram experiments, which really were a study of human behavior and authoritarianism and what it was that made a human being do or not do something. And these experiments were done at Yale. And they were done in the 1960s, as I remember it. And what happened was, is that there would be an actor who would sit behind a curtain or a booth or something and would pretend to be shocked by an electric wave, an electric shock. And the person doing the experiment would invite in a student um, or someone at random off the street in response to I think a newspaper ad and tell them to come in they'd pay them and they would say look sit here I want you to administer an electric shock you can't see the person that you're administering it to but I want you to administer an electric shock to this person if they get this question wrong if they get this question right, whatever, the, I forget the exact thing. And it took the person doing the experiment less than maybe five or ten minutes to convince the complete stranger coming in to do the experiment. Obviously, they were paid for it, but then to actually administer the shock. So they would turn up the voltage and the person doing the experiment would say, you can turn it up some more. And the actor, unbeknownst to the person being told to turn up the voltage, the actor would scream 
and shout. Now, that person wasn't actually being shocked with any voltage or electric current whatsoever. But the person who was being told to turn up that voltage did not know that. They had no idea. So what happened was is that they would turn it up and they'd look back at the person doing the experiment and the person would say, no, it's okay, go on. You can turn up that voltage just a bit more. And they did. And then the actor would scream, ah, scream really loud. And then the person doing the experiment would continue to tell them, the person turning up the voltage, go on, you can do some more. It's okay. I'll take full responsibility for it. And with that information, I take full responsibility for it. The person would turn up the voltage to all, to all, to the max. And you'd hear this person screaming, this ungodly yell. It hurts. Oh, my God. And it was all an act. The person was screaming and acting behind this curtain or in this next room. But the person who was being told to turn up the voltage did not know that the other person was acting. And quite frankly, after a while, they didn't think or care anymore about the kind of screaming that they heard. All that mattered to them is that they didn't have to be responsible for their own actions. Because this guy in a white coat was telling him or her, it's okay, I take full responsibility. You keep turning up that voltage. And that was a whole experiment geared toward this authoritarianism and people surrendering their own sense of agency and their own decision-making to some third party who is claiming that they will be responsible. Don't worry, you can, you can literally kill this person. You're not going to be in any kind of trouble. I will. And I think that is a microcosm of what crowds are. Because when you get people in a huge venue, assuming that they're there for something positive, you could create conditions potentially where one or two of those people do something really bad. And it can go either way. That person could do something really bad and then get booed out of town, booed out of the stadium. Or that person could do something really bad and then have 15 other people do it. Or 20 other people do it. Or 50 other people. Or 100. Just like what happened on Disco Demolition Night. What a genius idea that was. People rioting, running onto the field, tearing it up. And again, you thought that English football hooligans were bad. These people are absolutely monstrous. And that comes out of this sense of their safety in numbers. So when people say that there is safety in numbers, safety from what and from whom? Is there a togetherness? Is there safety in meaning that you are absolved of any responsibility because there's 50,000 of you here? You know, there's another study, and it might have been Milgram again, who said that the more people are around in a crowd, and the more people who are in that crowd and see something going on that's wrong, and that's morally reprehensible, the less likely any one of them is going to do something about it. And why is that the case? Well, he said, or someone said, it is because... The people in that large crowd are assuming someone else in that crowd will do something about this evil that is happening right in front of them. And so therefore, the people making that assumption give up their own agency and give up their own responsibility. Hence the example I just talked about with the Milgram experiments. It was about completely ceding your agency and authority and your responsibility as a human being 
and delegate and giving that to someone else in the name of obeying some command about turning up voltage. It's a really disturbing and terrifying thing about us as people. That we have something called conscience and we can either turn that conscience on or off. So that if you've got 10, 20, 30 people in a crowd and you see something going on that's wrong, there is less of a likelihood that anybody is going to do anything about it because people are generally thinking, oh, well, someone else will do something about it. Versus if you have two or three people watching something that's wrong, there is inherently more pressure for someone to do something about it because of the number of people there. Someone is assumedly going to stand up and be counted. And so therefore, because there are fewer people there, the onus is that one of those people is more likely to act and not delegate their own responsibility to someone else. Now, I forget the exact term of this. It might, I forgot what the terminology is for when people are in large crowds and they don't do anything. I mean, there's lots of terms for it. You know, cowardice and morally repugnant, whatever. But I'm talking about there's a documented scientific slash medical term for it. So that if you've got three people in a crowd or a group one of the odds are much higher that one of those three people is going to do something. But when you have this large crowd, thousands of people, people are less likely to do something. Hence the, you know, hundreds, you know, the thousands of white people watching black people getting lynched. Nobody came in and said, stop, stop, don't do this. They all sat there with grins on their faces, watching black people burnt at the stake, watching them get lynched. In the case of Kitty Genovese, it was in 1960s, in Queens, New York, people in their apartment buildings had either listened to or heard her get attacked, raped and murdered right there. Nobody really intervened in any way. Someone may have shouted at one point, um, but nobody intervened. Nobody. They either watched or heard her get raped and attacked and murdered and murdered. I mean, there's so many other stories like this. And then there are people who intervene. Then there are people who um, you know, rise to the occasion. Crowds are something. They're powerful. They can be a force for good. They can be a force for evil. And human history is replete with both. But sadly, I think, human history tends to lean towards crowds being the enablers and accomplices of some of the worst things in our history. As human beings. And there I would say is more of that. If you look at historical events. Than there are of the good things. Now I would like to think I'm wrong. And maybe in some ways I am wrong. When I look at what crowds generally gather for. But. Then again. I don't necessarily think I am wrong. Think back. In all of your life, again, you think of crowds. Do you like crowds? Do you like being around crowds? We're in a pandemic at the moment and it's getting worse and worse. Do you want to be around people in crowds? Even when this pandemic is over, really, is what I'm geared at here when I'm saying this to you. Do you want to get back to crowds? Will you look at crowds again the same? 
You go to a football match in the Premier League now, they're starting to let fans back in in England. 1,000 or 2,000 fans. 2,000 fans. And the days of the hooliganism in the 1970s, when people would run on the pitch, rip up seats, throw the... I mean, what happened in uh, 1989 in Hillsborough, where 96 people were killed... In a crowd, it was oh, it was that was down to overcrowding and the West Yorkshire police, who let more and more and more people in. That wasn't because of a crowd inherently. That was because of systemics and police and uh, negligent homicide, cr- criminally negligent homicide. But when you think about crowds, think back all the crowds in your life and all the crowds in. In history that you can think of, are crowds that you're thinking of, have they assembled more often for good, positive events? Or have all the crowds that you can think of, whether you are a part of them or not, gathered for things that are much more nefarious and violent and evil. There is something in us as human beings. You know, I'll never forget, you know, I watched some boxing years ago. I mean, it's probably back in the 70s. And I don't know, this is, this probably hits the radar of sexist. And I remember seeing there were women sitting around the circumference of the boxing ring. And they were so happy to see these men beating the living hell out of each other. Not that men should should be happy either. But I'm saying this because who knows some of those same women were, I don't know. But yet the glee in their eyes. I don't want to ascribe something sexual to that. That's not what I'm going at, getting at. Although I bet you, for both men and women, some men and some women, there is something sexual, perhaps, going on in watching these two people beat each other. Which is really evil to me. But people get their kicks on Route 66 in some very... Well, twisted ways. But maybe that's some of this kind of primal thing. Is that the reason why we slow down for some massive car pile up on a highway? Is that why we kind of slow down and pull out our cell phones? Oh, look at all this wreckage. Look at all this damage to this car. Are there any bodies lying around? Is that why we pull out our cell phones? To record it? I mean, is that it? I mean, at some point, I'm trying to disaggregate from the crowd issue. Someone of the New York Post once, and it's in the last five to ten years, took a photo of someone on a train track as a train is literally about to hit them. And I believe, if memory serves me correctly, somebody had rescued that person. I could be wrong. But the photographer did not. He chose to take the picture instead of rescue the person. And so, in an instance where there are no crowds, There was no affirmative responsibility that photographer had to do anything. And part of that is not only that the photographer is, well, I'm a New York Post photographer. That's not good enough for my view of a reason why you wouldn't try to save a life. I mean, would you do that? Would you take the picture or would you try to save the person's life or would you do nothing at all? And just walk away and just hope for the best. But the test 
wouldn't be, in my opinion, of that photographer. And a, and, a, and a defense would not be, well, I'm a New York Post photographer and I'm doing my job. I think the test would be, are you choosing to delegate your responsibility? And the other test would be, where's the law? Because there's no law that says there is any affirmative responsibility for you to help someone. Now, maybe in some of the states there is, but I can't think of any. Generally speaking, there is no law that says that if you see someone drowning in a pool, that you need to go and save them. Why? Well, one of the reasons why is because you can also, having saved them, be on the back of a lot of lawsuits, potentially, if there is something about that person's recovery in being saved that doesn't go right. And then you can be perhaps subject to a lawsuit. And the whole thing about jurisprudence in these areas is is that a society does not want to be held responsible for the operating costs of having people try to save lives only to be sued for it. Because the governing principle is you want to be able to try to save someone's life without having to be sued for it, having saved their lives. So the society does not want to produce a fear of Good Samaritans because the fear or or, or Good Samaritans being afraid to rescue people, if they know that there's a substantial likelihood they're going to face a lawsuit for their troubles. You know, they say no good deed goes unpunished. You know, I do find it interesting. Because at the very same time, doesn't that lack of a law in doing this, Good Samaritan laws, isn't there a problem there? Because then you're saying that as a society, it's okay to allow someone to die right before your eyes and not save them? Do you have a problem with that? Don't you have a problem with that? That you can just sit and watch a toddler drown in a pool and not be held liable? I mean, that frightens the hell out of me. But that's pretty much what the law says in this country. I don't know about other countries, but that's... You can literally sit there at the beach and watch some toddler. Now the parenting of that toddler would be something uh, something of very gross parental negligence. But you could watch some toddler get carried away to sea. I mean, God, I know this is so grotesque. I'm sorry. But I'm really trying to get to this really disturbing heart of where a human being's agency starts and stops, where a human being's assignation of responsibility begins and ends. And this crowd thing that I started with is a real barometer of that. And so when this person says to me, you know, I hate crowds, I really thought about that statement and examined it. Years later, but I guess better late than never. And this whole disco night and this demolition night, what that really meant was a desecration of culture, a desecration of a people through their music. Manifested years earlier, not that long earlier, with actual lynchings of black people that were watched by Hundreds, thousands of white people standing there watching. No one shouted out, that's enough. Stop, don't do it. Nobody. They stood there and they all participated in it by commission, by standing there. Then you put it into smaller venues like what happened in New Bedford, Bedford, Massachusetts back in the 70s or 80s. A woman was raped in a bar 
and these five or six guys were there chanting and those five were held guilty, I believe. It was based on a movie. The movie was based on it. You remember the movie The Accused, 1986? Same kind of thing, although a smaller crowd. Jodie Foster won an Oscar for that film. Harrowing film to watch. And you saw how these men, again, white men, were standing there watching. And the most baby-faced of them all engaged in the cheers the most. And that case held, I think, that the people cheering were held responsible. I think in the real life case, they got away. I don't even remember whether they were convicted or not. It happened in a bar. I mean, this is what's crazy and scary. There's an exhibitionist factor here, too. This performance or this violence that's being cheered on. And then this reluctance to look inward at toxic masculinity or at what white identity is, white male identity, and the fears that white men have and not excavating that, that those men are not, the men who participate in these things are not doing any level of internal excavation. And in the society that's being run by those men and the structures of patriarchy that govern that existence, they have no incentive to, although they should have an incentive to. But all of those things really do present some very uncomfortable examinations that must be undertaken because it's infinitely more uncomfortable for people being burnt at the stake than it is for us to be talking about this. Or, you know, more uncomfortable for people being lynched. And even worse than that, if you can imagine, you know what I'm talking about. Well, there isn't really much more uncomfortable than that, is there? When it comes to lynching. Crowds watching. We watch the NFL. Some of us do. I don't. Watch the NFL. You see all this violence. And it's all predicated on this gladi- gladiatorial gladi- gladiatorial kind of bloodlust. 100,000 100, people, not now of course, 100,000 people in a stadium watching people smash each other's heads, the helmets. This orchestration of crowds around violence. And this kind of fascistic streak that goes with it, this Nazi streak, this fascistic streak that runs through all of this, smashing up records, disco records, smashing up Dixie Chicks CDs. They're now called the Chicks. Natalie Maines back in 2003 in London telling a London... uh, audience that she performed that she and her um, fellow group members of the Dixie Chicks performed in London saying that no you know we're against this war and you know we're ashamed that uh, George W. Bush is is the president and that he's from Texas we're ashamed of that and we also support the troops however but we don't support the war and of course the last part never gets talked about the well we support the troops but not the war it was all about George W. Bush from Texas and we didn't, we're ashamed. That got around the world. And then you had all these people burning their CDs and, and smashing their CDs. Very kind of, again, this Nazi-like streak. 2003. You know, they had to go underground for six or seven years. They had to stop performing. I mean, Natalie Maines apologized. Then she, a few years later, didn't. She uh, revoked the apology. It was a very fascistic, jingoistic time around this Iraq war. And I've talked about Iraq as recently as um, just yesterday's episode. 
But this very jingoistic, fascistic thing. And again, it also becomes very misogynistic. So these three women, you know, are against war and you're going to burn their CDs? Really? You're going to smash their CDs up? They weren't cursing out the troops. They supported the uh, military personnel. They were against the war. So they come out against... So let's break this down a bit more. They come out against violence. They're anti-violence. Because that's what... When you're anti-war, you are anti-violence by definition, right? You are anti-violence. If you are anti-war, you are anti-violence. I'm not even going to say pacifist. That's obvious. But if you are anti-war... You are anti-violence. That means you are anti-killing people. You are against that. Which means, essentially, you're pro-life. I mean, that didn't stop... Brother... Brandon Bernard from being executed a few days ago. With a crowd watching that happen. And the state administering it. Never mind the guy was innocent. Lots of evidence showing that. Same thing with Nathaniel Woods months and months earlier in this calendar year. And there's at least six other people who Donald Trump wants to do the same to. During these last, what, 38 days? It's coming. He's going to be gone. We're getting to the finish line. But but this is... When you, uh, when you examine this, these pieces fit and don't fit. But they are part of the same puzzle, even if they don't fit neatly. And you see the violent underpinning, the misogyny as well as the racism. The same thing with Jane Fonda in the 1960s and early 1970s. You know, Hanoi Jane. You know, the kind of hatred that she got, the misogyny she got. From all of that, standing up against violence, and you had these violent men and some women supporting this immoral, illegal war against the Vietnamese. And she had the temerity, did Jane Fonda, who's still here, thank goodness, to support the Viet Cong and and, and just, you know, talk to them. And all of a sudden now, she's a pariah in America and you know, she's uh, death threats and Hanoi Jane and all this nonsense. These mobs would send a death threat. I mean, it's like what's going on now. These proud boys in crowds beating people. This is a fascistic country. And I've always argued, I've argued this for a long time. This didn't just happen in 2020 or 2015 or 16. This has been going on for centuries here. There's always been an effort and there's always been a fascistic bent. And I'm not just talking, well, the merger of corporate and state power. I'm talking about all the other things that are fascist and authoritarian. The way the police treat black people. All of these things. The state being an executioner. I mean, this is evil stuff. Crowds watching NHL hockey and allowing those men to be violent, to smash into each other at fast speeds, to get into fights on the ice. Gladiatorial. But in the NBA, when the mostly black men, if they dare, not that I'm advocating that they do, but if they if they dare react or retaliate, they're out. Technical foul, you're dismissed. Two technicals, you're done. You can't express your aggression. Not that I'm saying that there should be, but you know what I'm saying.
this attack on Jane Fonda, she had a she had to go underground herself. Then she revived her career in the eighties with the exercise tapes. Do you remember those? If you're of a certain age, do you remember those exercise tapes, Jane Fonda workout tapes? Those things, those VHSs, those things went through the roof on sales. Now she had won an Oscar, I believe it was nineteen seventy three for Clute. She played a, a prostitute who uh, is involved in this murder investigation or who may have... Anyway, is with Donald Sutherland. K-L-U-T-E, Clute. It's 1973, I believe. She won the Oscar for that. If I'm... Uh, again, I'm pretty sure that I'm correct. Crowds. Crowds. I could go on forever about them. There are lots of really good ones that are a source of inspiration and good feeling and affirmation of life, celebration, joy, love, spirit, feeling. Community, connection. And there are the crowds that are very much the opposite. The Donald Trump Nuremberg rallies, the original Nuremberg rallies, the lynch mobs. Charlottesville. Those crowds of people with tiki torches on the campus of the University of Virginia just three years ago. Crowds. Those words, you know, they still sit with me. I don't like crowds. I don't like crowds. I don't like crowds. Do they bring out the best in us? Or do crowds bring out the worst in us? Something to think about. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of the politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. Watching fans slide down that foul pole was like, oh my God. I mean, the field was on fire. You know, it was on fire. I've never seen a baseball field on fire before.